Hey, this is Jumpin' Jim Brenzel. When you have an opportunity, you got to listen to Count It Out with Mike and Tyler. To my left, ladies and gentlemen, the reigning Worldwide Wrestling Federation Heavyweight Champion Superstar Billy Graham. Before another capacity crowd here in Madison Square Garden, there are those here who certainly are in your favor, those who are not, Mr. Graham. Some are booing, some are cheering, but nevertheless, there's pandemonium tonight. There's excitement. Look at the people's faces. Look at the people's expressions. Can you feel it? Look at you. You're excited because I am the champion, the Worldwide Wrestling Federation champion, how can I retain this belt? Why am I still a champion after months and months and months? Because I'm in shape, I'm powerful, I'm strong. I wake up every morning, every morning, work out for five hours, run 19 miles a day, swim across the Atlantic Ocean, unbelievable condition. I am the man of the hour, the man with the power, too sweet to be sour, Mr. Excitement. Look at the pandemonium, look at the thousands of people, thousands of people. Oh, Will you defend your championship in other areas here in the United States? Anywhere in the world. Japan, Australia, United States, California, Mexico, I don't care, Central America, any state, any city, anywhere. That man is from Japan, all even dependent in Japan. Anywhere Thank you, you want. Thank you very much for your time. Superstar Billy Graham. Well, we are live, pals, and welcome to another edition of the Bill After Seal of Approved Count It Out with Mike and Tyler. My name is Tyler, and I am not joined by Hard Mike this week. There, Mike, I kept it alive for you, even though you're not here. I feel gross saying that. Um, I was going to say, but speaking of gross, that's a terrible segue because I love Steve, and <laughs> but I have to fuck with you every now and then. <laughs> Uh, we are joined today by Stone Cold Steve Bourne, filling in for Mike this week. Uh, Steve, man, what's going on, brother? Uh, not much, not much. Just in, uh, enjoying the long weekend. Um, uh, just basically uh, starting to get ready for summer. Mm-hmm. How about you? Uh, I am also enjoying a long weekend. Uh, my first weekend outside of the restaurant world, and it is weird, so... Here we are recording on a beautiful Sunday afternoon. I should have went outside to record. It's nice out. But whatever. Teach your own. I am drinking some Mike's Hard Iced Teas. And you are drinking a fun little ditty there. Tahiti Treat Vodka. Taking it all the way back to the childhood. I love that. Mm-hmm. Uh, this week, though, it is card subjected to change. Uh, I know last week we promised a conversation with pretty Ricky Wildley. Talking all about drop kicks for Devin, which will be happening on June 10th. We are going to do that next week now, uh, as well as I will be counting down the top seven comedy wrestlers of all time uh, with that list. Uh, But some unfortunate news in the world of professional wrestling uh, has kind of made us just want to shift our focus a little bit this week. And we are going to be talking all about one superstar, Billy Graham, uh, who sadly passed away. 79. Was that the age I read? Yeah, 79 is 79 years old. Um. I, I'm going to just go on record and say that I think that Billy Graham might be one of the most criminally underrated performers of all time. And and the amount of people that look up to him and, and stole from him and borrowed from him and uh, the influence that he had on the business. I don't think that the world talks enough about the superstar. Uh, what's your take on that? Oh, 100 percent. I mean, he was basically the Muhammad Ali of wrestling. And if anyone hasn't seen the documentary WWE released about 15, 20 years ago, 20 years too soon, the Billy Graham story, any, everyone needs to see that it's brutally candid, brutally honest. Um, Billy Graham goes through his ups and downs. He tells you about his drug addiction, his steroid, how he sued Vince McMahon just to, uh, for the steroid trial, just so he can get some money. Um, after they let him go after his ankle fusion surgery. Um, and he talks about his reunion when he saw when uh, SummerSlam 2003 was back in Arizona. Mm-hmm. 
on Vince's on Vince's birthday of all things, and Billy Graham was allowed to go backstage and meet meet the boys. Um, Vince, it's funny. Vince knew how important Billy Graham was. Um, probably a lot more so than his old man. One hundred percent. I mean, the, they even say that the reason Billy Graham only had a short title reign, only about nine and a half months, and back then that's considered a short reign. Is Billy Graham got over on his own, and Vince Senior wanted the All American good guy, uh, white meat baby face, and that's Bob Backlund was in the right place at the right time. Yeah, and and let's not you know Bob Backlund's another guy that people don't understand just how over he was at the time as well. And we're going to talk a lot mm-hmm. about Billy and Bob as this episode goes on, but um, basically from from my understanding is that Bruno San Martino was in the uh, towards the end of his historic seven year title run. Uh, no, sorry, this would have been his second title run, the four-year, four or five-year yeah. one. Yeah, sorry, his other historic title run that he had. Um, <laughs> but the the burnout was getting to Bruno, and and he was looking he was looking for a break to to take some time off, reduce his schedule a little bit. Uh, Vince Senior wanted Bob Backlund to be his successor, but you got to get the belt from Bruno to Bob, and you know, especially during that time period, you're not doing baby face against baby face, and. There's exactly. nobody that was going to become a babyface over Bruno anyways because he was so over. And that's where you enter superstar Billy Graham, who made his return to the company at that point, shocked the world yeah. by defeating Bruno for the world title. With and the feet on the ropes. With the feet on the ropes, of course, right? And it uh, it really shocked the wrestling world. But then Billy just became this own, like his own omen. And, and Vince Sr., has gone on record, I'm pretty sure, of saying that he made a mistake by sticking to his original plan and maybe not keeping the belt on on Billy a little bit longer. He had 10 straight sellouts at MSG. Um, mm-hmm. Guy was drawn like crazy. He was over. But but he was also over enough where you're right, Steve. He didn't need the title either. But uh, definitely one of, the, one of the better world champions, I think, as far as I'm concerned. Oh, 100%. And he's got a bit of almost like, when they put him with the Grand Wizard um, as his mouthpiece, it's an interesting thing because it made Billy Graham's promos as miles ahead as they were even more special. And it's a lot like with Roman Reigns and Paul Heyman right now. Roman can talk on his own, mm-hmm. and he proved it. But adding Paul Heyman do most of the work for him, so when it makes Roman talk, it feels that much more special. And it was the same with uh, the Grand Wizard and the Superstar. And the gems that you got out of Billy Graham are still used to this day. I still say, still like the joke of what you see is what you get. What you don't is better yet. Um, I mean, like I said, that was back in 77. That was, all, yeah. that was 45 years ago plus. The, and it's still one of the best catchphrases ever in pro wrestling. The title 20 years too soon of his DVD and his book. Um, very fitting with Billy Graham. And, and you hear oh, that a lot. Oh, Oh, you know, that person would be, they were ahead of their time. They'd be great. And now superstar Billy Graham, you could take him from the seventies and slide him in right now. And he would be over. Oh yeah. Uh, have you seen uh, triple H's induction speech of Billy Graham in the Oh uh, four hall of fame? I've seen it. Uh, I haven't watched it in a long time, but uh, I know it's very good. I know triple H hit some of those patented quotes in, in his speech yep. as well. And what a great guy. Triple H was the guy for that speech as well. Oh, yeah. No, because even Triple H, I think Triple H was the one who coined the phrase. He was 20 years too soon. And um, uh, he said he called him the original sports entertainer. You can't argue that. No, not at all. Because he was the first guy who was a muscle-bound guy. He wasn't the greatest worker in the world, not by any means. No. But he he could, (laughs) he was entertaining. And if anybody hasn't seen the two mad, the two big matches he had with Dusty, the uh, Texas death match and the bull rope match bloody as holy hell. Oh, and yeah. the crowd never sat down. Oh yeah. Yeah. Those guys, um, you got two of the greatest ta- probably the two greatest talkers of all time. Cause don't forget, I don't know if uh, you, rem- you know, but they used to tag together in Florida. That's correct. Um, when uh, Billy Graham start went out there. I mean, a lot of people also don't know Billy Graham actually played in the CFL. Correct. Also, and he was one of the first graduates of the heart dungeon. I was just going to say, a lot of people don't know, Billy Graham is uh, a protege of Stu Hart. I believe his quote was, Stu didn't teach me how to wrestle, but he sure beat the hell out of me a lot. Something yep, along those lines. Much, yeah. 
Uh, Billy also did uh, reconnect with Natty as well. And and uh, I think he was always proud of that, being a part of that heart legacy. And I think he was really happy to to be with Natty and to reconnect that family legacy there. Oh, for sure. Um, I mean, reading more about Billy Graham, I mean, the, like I said, the documentary that WWE did widen your eyes so much to him. Um, but also reading more about him that uh, – he put he was pissed off uh, that they put Abdullah in the Hall of Fame because he didn't like um, having non WWE guys in there. But then again, he reconnected again. I mean, he just apparently in two thousand twenty one, he <laughs> just signed a new five year uh, Legends mm-hmm. contract, so he was still in the fold um, when he passed. And so that's why WWE's put a ton of stuff up on the network and their social media. Yeah, and you know, Billy, he was never afraid to speak his mind. Sometimes it was really good, sometimes it was really bad. Uh, yep. You know, well, let's not sugarcoat it. He he made some false accusations about the company as well to try to get some money, and he wasn't yep. afraid to admit that. And it's really yep. unfortunate though that he did that because Billy Graham was one of the first real um, pro people for steroids. And then he was also yep. one of the first con people for steroids so after seeing the effect that it had on his body. And I, I really think that some of those false accusations that he made really hurt the steroid movement for a little bit. I think he could have really been a face of that. And, and you know, look what it's done to me, a liver transplant, ankle reconstruction. Like he was in really, really kids. bad health. Yeah, he was in really, really bad shape for a long time because of the, the abuse that he put his body through with the steroids. Yeah, because he said in the documentary he did steroids for about 65 to 1990. 25 yeah. years he did steroids. Yeah. And like you no. see, he wouldn't sugarcoat it. After he dropped the title to Backlund, he went into a dark place because he, he he felt betrayed by the company. Um, And instead of chasing Backlund for the title for a bit, he basically went into a drug-induced coma for about two years and came back with probably one of the worst follow-up gimmicks of all time. Yeah, that karate gimmick, right? That karate gimmick, yeah. Um, For, like, more of our younger audience, if there's anyone listening to this, uh, to me, like, Billy Graham dropping the title to Bob Backlund, it reminds me a lot of when Edge dropped the title to Cena after Edge won it for the first time, where they always had a plan to put it back there. But Edge just did such a great job of getting himself over that maybe it wasn't the right move to do that. And I don't know. That's like, I think, the closest comparison to the modern era that that you can get from that time period with Billy Graham. You can't argue. Um, I mean, there's many cases where guys like unexpectedly got over. um, And and end up. Oh, you could also say Zack Ryder. Mm hmm. Um, when Zack Ryder had the U.S. title, the plan was always, I think, to get eventually get it back on Swagger. But um, no one expected Ryder, uh, starting with the, the YouTube show, to get over as well as he did. And all it took was one push of a wheelchair off a ramp to end hey, a push. Bye. You know, and let, let's not also forget about all the work that Billy Graham did in the AWA as well. Yep. He had a very big run in the AWA. Out in Florida, yep. he had a big run. He always had a really... Uh, somehow, he always ended up teaming up with Ivan Koloff in a lot of places, which is a weird pairing, but it worked. And I also think it's really cool that they were a tag team because they were also the two guys that dethroned Bruno for the title as well. Exactly, yeah. Interesting in itself. Um, But yeah, like, the the brutal honesty of his DVD is something that you don't see a lot in WWE standards, especially... You know, WWE has always been known to kind of tip the scale a little bit, maybe rewrite a little bit of history from time to time. And this wasn't the case. And and I just you you have to admire somebody that can take a step back and be like, I was wrong here. I fucked up here. I was successful here. Like, even though he made up those lies in the early 90s, like, I really think he did such a great job of redeeming his credibility. As the years went on. Yeah. Uh, um, especially coming out, especially, well, also advocating for organ transplants. Because um, <laughs> he even said as soon as he woke up from the liver transplant, he felt like somebody just turned the clock back. Yeah. And he didn't realize just wh- how much one organ can do. 
Mm-hmm. As we have our alcoholic drinks. <laughs> Fair. My liver might not be great for somebody else, but I will happily be an organ donor if I go. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. So they said, even people who just have a cup, like two or three catchphrases, you can thank Billy Graham for that. Hundred percent. And Billy Graham, because like, nobody really had a catchphrase until the superstar came in. And it's funny though, because like. Billy Graham didn't even really have a catchphrase. He just said he had such multiple things. He had multiple sayings that were so impactful that they just stuck through the annals of time. Like he, it's not yeah. like he went out there and did a road dog skit, you know? Oh, you didn't yeah. know, and the crowd would sing along with him. Billy was just being organic and being original, yeah. and you know, yeah, he might do them like maybe from town to town, the same thing here or there. But for the most part, he wasn't going out there and rehashing anything either. No, it was it definitely not an Enzo Amore. You can't teach that. No, absolutely. Um, no, he was the. I mean, basically, I think the only one who had probably as many catchphrases as he did was The Rock. Yeah, but again, The Rock was you know sing Rock along had with about the Rock. four or five that he. But also, this is the difference between when you only saw a superstar maybe once a month, pours The Rock uh, four to five times a month. Yeah, fair. That's also fair. Different time period for sure. Uh, also, very instrumental in the success of Arnold Schwarzenegger was Billy Graham oh, as yes. well, which you know one of the biggest stars in the world. Like, yeah, yeah, we're and we're gonna talk about that because uh, superstar Billy Graham is so important that we're actually gonna do two lists this week. You have a list prepared, and I have also yep. a list prepared. Uh, Steve's gonna start us off this week. He's going to do the top seven people that superstar Billy Graham influenced over his career, and then I'm yeah, going uh, to bring it home with, and uh, uh, indirectly. In, yes, and I'm going to bring it home with the top seven moments of Superstar Billy Graham's career, uh, according to me, of course. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Do you have anything else you want to talk about, Billy, or you want to start getting into some of these lists? Um, no, Let's get, get into the list. I'm going to start number seven with a deep cut. And th- this <laughs> guy was influenced by Billy Graham's wardrobe more than anything else with the colors and stuff like that. I'm going Ravishing Rick Rude. Okay, yeah. Yeah, you know, um, Rude uh, was, I mean, a lot of those guys in the 80s had their strict colors and di- didn't waver on it. Rude, you never knew what his colors were going to be, especially at the feud with, with Jake Roberts. With the oh, Rooster. yeah. <laughs> that was such a fuck you. <laughs> well, you got to think. And too, also, like... Rude was a big, Rude was a muscular guy. Mm-hmm. I mean, because, like I said, the superstar brought in the muscular guys instead of the uh, the crushers or Dick the Bruisers that you saw at the AWA who had the the guts. Um, he was the first one who brought like true fitness into professional wrestling. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, even Bruno wasn't in the greatest shape. No, no, he wasn't. Yeah, it was a different era for sure. And and Root, like, I think the equivalent of like that that changing of gear that you talk about there. Is the equivalent to you know ten years, fifteen years earlier than that with a tie dye with superstar for sure. He came out with yeah. a different look every week. It wasn't as extreme as Rick Rude did, but the time didn't allow for that to happen either. But those seeds also definitely money. must have been planted, right? Uh, for yeah. that time period with the robes and the the sequence gear and, and stuff like that. Uh, you know, you shit. you could even say a little bit of Ric Flair might have been in there for Rude as well, but I'm sure <laughs> I'm sure we'll talk about that name a little bit later. So I'm just gonna kind of kibosh it right there. Yeah. So number six, Ric Flair. There we go. What a segue! <laughs> eh? What a segue! <laughs> yeah, and I'm saying the Nature Boy is my is actually my number six. Um, and I'm just going just with the pure showmanship and with the the catchphrases. And um, the wardrobe as well. Well, and I'm glad you mentioned Flair because something that I just said a couple minutes ago, Billy Graham didn't have those signature sing-along catchphrases. Well, guess yeah. what? Neither did Ric Flair back in the day. Ric no. Flair would come out there and say, you know, these alligators are worth more than a year of your pay and whatever. And he would just have these amazing one-liners that you could never do a catchphrase of. You know what I mean? And and, and yeah. it's stuck. And if you look at it, if you look at it now, like Ric Flair's catchphrases are more popular now than they were in the 70s and 80s. And the now he's like, this, jet flying. yeah. And all the rappers are like, they've latched on to Ric Flair. But I guarantee you that if the of, of, of all that generation and this generation of rappers go back 10 more years and look up superstar Billy Graham, he's going to be, he'd be right there with Flair in terms of, you know, that 
culture or whatever that flare drip whoop, whoop, whatever fuck i don't get it exactly but. yeah so number six is big papa pump scott steiner number five you mean or for five sorry yes five i mean a hell of a goatee uh, big... oh yeah well the, the facial hair is identical the body's identical um billy graham was a bit better on the mic uh because you actually understood him and he <laughs> yeah. didn't have complex math problems that would confuse a harvard professor or at least he <laughs> didn't put them out there <laughs> we exactly, don't know what billy yeah. graham's math skills are like i'm not gonna put him over yeah. on that yeah but it, yeah at least he didn't tr- try <laughs> on air and also but again i mean basically when scott steiner at the end of his wcw run began and his second run with WWE in uh, 2002, 2003, he was almost like a small, like a shorter version of the superstar. 100%. Just you know, not you, colorful tights. Well, you take a look at, at, you know, he made a heel turn, right? And he wanted yeah, to make a he difference. Turned he NWO. Want, yeah, he wanted to stand out a little bit. So all of a sudden he went from having long black hair and a black goatee uh, to having short white hair and the white goatee with the little superstar black in the middle there and that's exactly where he got it from and he was not shy to talk about that then you look at their physiques like those guys had the biggest arms i've ever seen in my entire life and and even the way that even even the way they talked on the microphone as well scotty tried Mm. his best but nobody's the superstar but he had that he he had that same flow that the superstar would have as well he tried to follow that that pattern 100 i think this is a great call uh, number four, we're going to the great one, The Rock. Fair. And I'm just talking about on the microphone, having multiple lines, multiple catchphrases, multiple lines that people remember. Um, And also later in The Rock's career, when he became more Dwayne The Rock Johnson uh, with the, the bodybuilding. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Even um, I, I, I really want to phone in on Hollywood rock. I feel like Hollywood yeah. rock was, was a yeah. lot more towards oh, superstars. Hollywood, awesome. Hollywood rock is my favorite rock. I think uh, that mother Canucker promo he cut in Toronto, which I was there for live is one of the greatest promos I've ever seen. Oh, I, w- I was there too. That was Toronto, heat. brother. That's where yeah. I'm from. <laughs> I actually, I stole that. Cause every time I go to like a concert or anything and the band's like, let's go Toronto. I always yell out. Hey, that's where we live, Toronto. <laughs> yeah. well, oh, I, I, oh, yeah, no, it, it was just so damn funny. And it's like uh, quicker than a buck, the best thing to hit Toronto because the Maple Leafs suck. I thought the crowd was going to kill them. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, gee, I wonder what those rhymes, where those came from. Yeah, exactly, yeah. What you see is what you get. What you don't is better yet. 100%. <laughs> yeah. Uh, number three, it's time to play the game. Yeah, I mean, Triple H is a historian among historians, so this isn't shocking oh, yeah. to see him on your list. Yeah. No, um, I mean, there's a reason why Triple H inducted him into the Hall of Fame in 04. Um, Billy Graham said that was a huge <laughs> honor having Triple H at the time because Triple H was the biggest heel in the business back in Absol- 2004. Absolutely. Um, and having, and let's face it, when Billy Graham won the title of Bruno, he was probably the biggest heel in the business at the time, too. And if he wasn't at that moment, he sure became it right after. <laughs> exactly, yeah. And especially with those uh, matches with Dusty. Yeah, but a lot of guys ended up as a bloody mess. A lot of similarities there, especially at that time with Triple H too, doing the evolution. Triple H yep. with the long, you know, he had the long hair still. He was yep. coming out in the, the suit. Not beard, flashy, the, he had the beard. The, um, the chops, the, uh, Superstar would have the chops every now and then. Oh, yeah, for sure. I, I, I think yeah. that was a lot more... Harley Race, maybe, than Superstar Billy Graham for Triple H at also that point. Also a bit of Lemmy, for, Lemmy from Motorhead. Maybe a little so. bit of Lemmy as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Number two is uh, it's Hulk, Hulkamania's running wild. It's got to be. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, without Superstar, there's no Hulk Hogan. Um, especially without, and I'm pretty sure you can guess my number one is. But um, Hogan was even... Uh, was it uh superstar even said or somebody who said on that dvd and the hogan will admit it he's a poor imitation of superstar yeah <laughs> if if superstar were a baby face in in his world title run he would have been the hogan. hulkster 100 yeah. and if if the, the he was superstar, turning into that too 100 he was and 
And, you know, it's too bad that those guys end up having such bad blood with each other. And, and they really got nasty with each other over the years. But especially the steroid trial. No, 100%. But they had a fun little, when Superstar made his reunion in 86, when he made his comeback after the hip replacement yep. surgery, like they paired them up a whole bunch. And, and that was a lot of fun. Yeah, because that was trying to get Superstar back over again. Yeah, and, um, and he was super over crowd. for a little bit there. Yep. And but the the work he did, I just a little sidebar here. The work he did with Gorilla Monsoon on the first SummerSlam, yeah, is still legendary. I will I will give a spoiler that it is a the top honorable mention in my list for for superstar Billy Graham and his career moments. Yeah, um, and number one is Jesse the Body Ventura. Uh, I will say I was doing some research on Superstar this week, and I was watching his return match from hip replacement surgery. And yep. Jesse Ventura, as he's making his entrance, goes, "Oh my, or, oh McMahon, this guy stole everything from me. He's a complete ripoff <laughs> of Jesse." Even- and you could just see, like, that was Jesse you can paying hear homage, screaming, laughing. <laughs> yeah, and, and and that was Jesse's way of paying homage for sure. One hundred percent. This is the locked in number one. Uh, I would have, I would have to fight you if it wasn't your number one for sure. Because originally, before I did any sort of research, I was thinking. Hogan Ventura, but then the more I did just even five minutes, I'm realizing, yeah, no, the body's number one. 100%. Yeah. Um, I've got a few honorable mentions. Mm-hmm. Uh, Paul Orndorff. Absolutely. Just with the, the muscles. Yeah. And also, since Superstar was a bit of a cool heel, I'm going probably one of the biggest cool heels in the last 30 years, Kevin Nash, Diesel. Yeah, you could even say Scott Hall to put, tie them right in together, right? And a couple of, uh, and uh, the Ultimate Warrior. Yeah. And uh, the Animal Batista. Yeah, yeah, I don't... Uh, Just with, with with the bodybuilding. I don't hate your list at all. I, I might maybe put Triple H a little higher on your list, I think. Uh, I couldn't put him above Hogan because Hogan was so close. No, I mean like the other way. Like I would have gone up oh, like, like close to the lower, top. Yeah. yeah, I would have... Uh, I would have maybe gone because to me, Triple H was really being like Harley Race at that point. I think he was really, yeah. but you can definitely see the influence the superstar had for sure. I can't argue with your list too much though, man. I think you did a great job on that. Uh, any, you got any, uh, any ones I missed? I think you'd pretty much nailed all of them. You know what I mean? Like I'm trying to think of like people that radically changed their look. I mean, you could even say to an extent and I, I'm gonna, you know, this is like really loose, but you could you could say guys like Jericho and The Undertaker, guys that are constantly reinventing themselves because Superstar reinvented himself on more than one occasion. Was it always oh, successful? Sure. No, but he was still a draw. Even that martial arts gimmick, he was selling out MSG with Bob Backlund still. Yeah. Yeah, so. it, it, just looking back on him, I'm going, that's not Superstar. No, <laughs> but, and, and, you know, he's admitted that that wasn't his best run, but... uh we are going to talk about a little bit of my list, though, because he it did produce a pretty cool moment. Okay. Well, uh, with no further ado. Yeah, let's. Uh, so this is my this is my top seven superstar Billy Graham career moments or milestones or whatever. Right. Um, number seven. I want to go back to I believe it was October of nineteen October sixteenth, nineteen eighty seven, to be exact. It was his last main event in Madison Square Garden. It was a steel cage match with himself versus the natural Butch Reed. Ooh, that'd be a uh, nice little... I haven't seen that match. I, I can't find the match anywhere, but I think this moment is important to put on the list because mm-hmm. Madison Square Garden and Billy Graham are synonymous with each other. This was Billy's kind of, I think, his last biggest high-profile match that he ever had as a professional wrestler because he would have to I mean, retire shortly after went- this. Sorry, I was say there's a reason why you went into the Hall of Fame in Madison Square Garden. A hundred percent, there is right, and and you know, I just think it's such a a, a beautiful thing that that and his feud with Butch Reed was really fun as well. Butch Reed's got some great promos on him. They were doing the the rehab angle with Billy coming back from an injury, and and it built up beautifully to this cage match. Billy got the win in it, which I think was great, and I just think it's a a nice final chapter in the in-ring career of Billy Graham. Can't really argue. I mean, uh, if anyone see, wants to see how Butch Reed can do uh, in a cage match, look at him and Flair. 100%, right? 100%. Uh, for my number six, 
I found this promo on YouTube, uh, and it's from his karate Billy Graham days. And it's this angle that he shot. This was when he made his return to the WWF, and he attacked Bob Backlund and destroyed the WWF title. And it was just this really powerful angle that they shot where, you know, Vince McMahon is yelling at him, what are you doing? This is disgusting. What are you doing? And, and he's ripping the belt up. You know, this used to be my belt. I'm coming. Like if I can't have it, nobody can have it. He was yelling. And Bob Backlund was selling and screaming from the inside. And the way Backlund responded to it was really, really cool. This was a, this was an awesome angle. And, and even further that more, you kind of segue that into his rivalry with Bob Backlund. Bob Backlund was the guy that beat Billy Graham for the world title. And, and they drew a lot of money together over a long period of time. So, you know, when Billy Graham made his return as the martial arts guy, he targeted Bob Backlund and they drew money again at MSG. Well, it was the only program for um, Billy Graham to come back. It was the only one that made sense. Because mm-hmm. um, if he didn't, come back going for the title it shows to him that the title was meaning it would show to the fans that the title was meaningless i also thought it was a kind of a cool way to bring that karate gimmick into because it's like i don't know a whole lot of it like, it's hard to find footage from that time period and because you know it's it's a little before our time but to me it kind of just seems like he lost the title disappeared for a long time went crazy and came back as a karate guy like it made sense yeah, it shows you know how- yeah, it shows that the title, losing the title, he lost himself. Yeah, yeah. So I, I thought that was, uh, I thought it was a powerful angle that that led to some big matches at Madison Square Garden. Speaking of big matches, my number five was a very big match. We are going all the way back to January twenty fifth, nineteen seventy eight, in the Orange Bowl. It is the title for title unification match: Superstar Billy Graham versus Harley Race. Ooh. They went for an hour. And this was a this was an NWA show. This was an NWA show, and and at this time you were seeing those unification matches. You know, uh, Harley Race and Bob Backlund had one. Ric Flair and Rick Martel had one in the AWA NWA there over in Japan. Um, this wasn't uncommon to see champions try to unify that title to draw a house. This drew a big house at the Miami Orange Bowl. Uh, they fought in the rain, which was kind of cool. There's a clip version of this match on YouTube, which I have gone back and watched, and it's really cool to watch. Uh, I think Billy kind of worked a little bit more as a face in this match, which was cool to see during this time period. And well, yeah, Race going, was such a heel. Oh, 100%. And going an hour with Harley Race, you know, it just adds credibility to both guys' titles. One hour time limit yeah. draw, big match, drew a big house. I and mean, where is this, the Orange Bowl, you said? Orange Bowl, yeah. In Florida. So if we want to continue talking about big matches, drawn big houses, let's talk about the bull rope match with Dusty Rhodes. That is my oh, number four. Yeah, yeah um, no, if they like said to our younger viewers, go back and watch this because these two guys just beat the holy hell out of each other. Yes. Uh, if I was still doing the classic match classroom show with Anthony, this would be on the top of my list of, of wanting to do an episode based around this feud. Oh, Anthony needs to watch some superstar. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, fantastic. Not only like it, like the build of this, they had two or three matches in the garden, I think. I believe two for sure, three. I know. It was it was it's, three. The first one uh, then was the Texas Death match, then the bull rope. Yes, and all of them. And and it's just so cool too to see Dusty Rhodes in Madison Square Garden during this time period. But yeah. I mean if, if you're senior doing... in charge. 100%. And if you're doing a list of top seven promo guys of all time, which one day I will do, I'm just way too terrified to take it on right now because that's such a huge list. Both yeah. these guys are probably going to be on the list. Top three. Yeah. I mean, it's tough. It's tough not to put Superstar on there. Dusty Dusty might be one of my favorite promos of all time. So, the you know, best babyface promo of all time. Yeah. And then, you know, your Pipers and your Flares and. And then you know that's not even looking at the at the current day roster either. Some guys are cutting promos, man. Cody Rhodes to me is really yeah. putting his name out there. He cuts some promos that make you tug at the heartstrings. So yeah, the, but this match though, the violence, the the <sighs> hatred that built, the the promos with Vince at ringside, all of this is worth going out of your way to try to find. 
Yeah, no, uh, exactly. Um, if you watch on the net on the WWE Network, once they start busting each other open hard way, it does go black and white. Yeah, for, find it on YouTube. Purposes. Find it on YouTube. Yeah. Um. So my number three, I'm gonna kind of do a little bit of a cheat code here because it's not for say a moment that happened in his career. But I want to reference your list and just the amount of people that he influenced. Um, it might not be a, a defining moment that he did. However, it is his legacy. And his legacy yeah. is is that of just brilliance. And yeah. I mean, it just has to be talked about. We just talked, we just did a whole list of seven people plus four honorable mentions of or five honorable mentions of people he influenced. And that's massive. Like and, and yeah. I just wanted to pay homage anybody, to that. Is there anybody who influenced that many? I don't think Maybe so. Maybe Flair. Man. Well, you could say Flair. I I think Flair would probably be that one, but I don't know, man. He's up there. Superstars got to be close to the top of the list. Yeah, I mean, I I mean we've we've covered it so much already, but. The the infl- I mean, he was like Triple H said though, like I said earlier in the hall in his Hall of Fame speech, he was the first true sports entertainer. I mean, a lot of people could say, "Oh, Gorgeous George," but Le- Gorgeous George was a different different cat sort of deal. Yeah. yeah. But Billy Graham, what I mean, Billy Graham was a true entertainer. Yeah, he was the first kind of complete package too, because Billy could yeah. go in the ring. Absolutely, oh, he yeah. could. I mean, he wouldn't put. He's no Brian Danielson or anything. No. Like that. But he can hold his own. Absolutely. As we oh, we got to run from Lucy we the Cat here. In. Yeah, we got to run him from Lucy the Cat. It's been a while since you've been on the show there, Lucy the Cat. Uh, <laughs> let's get to the number two here. And we're going to take it back to his WWE Hall of Fame induction. Yep. Uh, I, I think that important. night was more important to him than a lot of people knew. I, I think maybe getting that that reconnection with the company was was a big deal to him. Getting honored at WrestleMania 20 weekend is fantastic. And just the absolute, you know, honor of having Triple H induct him. I believe he was the headliner that year, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, no, actually, Jesse was. Oh, Jesse was? Well, I mean, the real headliner, obviously. Obviously, the best speech was Bobby, but Je- but but Superstar yeah. was the big yeah, draw. That was the first... That was the first year they started re- doing Hall of Fame every year at WrestleMania weekend. I wish they would go back to this format also of the banquet style Hall of Fame. As opposed to in front of the big crowds. I hate it. I hate listening to the wrestling it's fans less- ruin it. Oh, and they yeah. do. Listen, this is a Hall of Fame induction. Dress respectable. Shut the fuck up. We're not here to hear your chants on the Hall of Fame. Yeah. No, this is yeah. Well, I mean, uh, was it? Uh, I think it was in 2019 when the fan ran in. Um, oh, and, and push f- Brett over. F- Sorry, and push Brett right. Push Brett, and then when they're carrying him out, one of the guys at the revival FTR <laughs> just hammered. Him. Oh yeah, <laughs> just knocked his ass out. Oh yeah. Well, because the FTR worship worships Brett like a god. Well, I'll tell you, you a you story. Fuck Brett, you fuck with us. When I when I went to AEW Rampage taping in Toronto, I was on the front row. And FTR was in the main event, and they were wearing the pink and black Bret Hart tights, right? Yeah, because that's the what they wore for their two out of three falls with DIY. Yeah, and uh, I was yelling at Dax. Dax was the bald one, right? Yeah, yeah. Dax was the bald yeah. one. I was I was that's yelling at him, yeah. and I and I was front row, so obviously he could hear me. And I was like, "Love the tights, brother! Love the tights!" Mm-hmm. And he looked down at me, and he just goes, "I'm just a mark too, brother. I'm just a mark." <laughs> like. Yeah. So yeah, the respect well, is definitely there. Well, I mean, the match they had together in the Owen Hart Memorial Tournament was pretty much a move for move with uh, Brett and Owen at WrestleMania 10. Absolutely, it was. Yeah, I love that. I I I love FTR. I think they're phenomenal and and big fans of what they do. Probably the best tag team, at least definitely outside the WWE and probably in the world right now. Would they make your top seven of all time? Probably number seven. If they, yeah, they might. That's my list that I will do one day. I will take on my top seven tag teams of all time. Because right now, I think of the top seven tag teams of all time, I think at least three are still active. And I'm going Usos, 
uh, FTR and New Day? I don't know if the New Day makes my list. I think so, just for longevity in an era where tag teams aren't held together for a long time. If I'm doing top seven WWF tag teams or WWE tag teams of all time, they're a shoe in. But if I'm looking yeah, at they're the, probably number two or three. Yeah, I would I would say they're tough not to be on there. But I mean like the Usos, I, I think I think the Usos have a case to be the greatest WWE tag team of all time. I think they already are. I, I agree. I think especially main eventing WrestleMania this year, I think lock them in. I also think that the, the Usos, Usos are entry. I, I think they're making a case to be the greatest tag team of all time as well. Yeah. Right now, who would you have? Is that Dudleys or LOD? I I might give a slight nod to the Dudleys, but it's tough. Yeah. Uh, it depends but on what you I would probably put the Usos number three. Yeah, but you know what though? Like just because the Usos haven't traveled the world and, and companies like yeah. other teams have doesn't mean mm-hmm. it should hurt them also. Because if I'm no. looking at their accolades they might have done more than the other teams as well. I don't know yeah. about drawing money. You know, the Road Warriors obviously drew the most money, and that's important. But that's a different era also. So, Yeah. I mean, Uso, the crowd still pops when you hear the opening of their song. The Usos. Crowd 100%. still pops. 100%. It's a tough one between those three teams. You can make a case for all of them being number one, and that's why I'm also not ready to take that list on either yet. <laughs> But of course, my actual number one, I don't think it is any surprise at all. It's April 30th, 1977 in Baltimore, Maryland, putting his feet on the ropes to capture the WWF championship from Bruno San Martino. And to clarify for younger viewers, why is there three W's? Uh, Because I need to get the F out on two of them. No. (laughs) (laughs) It's the Worldwide Worldwide Wrestling Federation. Federation. Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, this was the career highlight by far, probably the most underrated world champion in history of the company. Um, we talked about it at length throughout this whole episode. I'm not really going to go back and rehash it all. I do like that. He used his feet on the ropes to win the title. And when he lost the title to Backlund, his foot was under the rope was on the rope on the rope and the ref didn't see it. So there was that like double standard there, which is great. Yeah, absolutely. Um, a historic night in Baltimore that caught the wrestling world by storm, and he took the ball and he ran with it. Yeah. I mean, you, there's not much else to say. Do you think and of that title reign? Belt, where his best promos came in. If he didn't have that run with the championship, do we talk about Superstar Billy Graham the same way that we do? I think we do. Not the same way, but I think we still talk about him. Yeah. Just because he was such a breath of fresh air. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, this place, like I've gone back to, like what he even says, look at all the colors on my body. <sighs> and it's like he comes out in in October with autumn colors. In the summer, it's the bright tie-dye. I mean, we all say this person gets it. Billy Graham got it before anybody knew what it was. Yep. Sorry, Jericho. <laughs> he had it. <laughs> Uh, I love the story that Bill After tells. I can't remember if he told on our show or not. I'd have to go back and listen because I my memory is terrible. But about working with Billy Graham, just walking down Times Square with him. Mm-hmm. And there's that really famous picture where Billy just took his shirt off and got up and hit the pose in the middle of Times Square. And After was shooting the pictures. It's in his book for sure. His wrestling fixed. I didn't know it was broken. One of my favorite wrestling books of all time. Yeah. His wrestling fix, I didn't know it was broken. Yeah. yeah. Great highly, title, too. It is. It is a great title. Highly recommend checking that book out. And uh, I don't know, man. I, I don't have much more to say about the superstar. I think we did a pretty good job of uh, of honoring the superstar this week, you know, and it's too bad we had to do that. And it's too bad that, you know, the last couple of years of his life were, were so tough for him. But, the, you know, the impact that he left on the world of professional wrestling is one that I hope will get carried on. And I hope that in his passing, his legacy will continue to grow as well. I'm sure, especially when you've got probably one of the biggest wrestling historians in Triple H, Paul Levesque, running the W, running creative for the most part right now. I mean, Vince will still pop his head in here and there, but Stephanie sounds like Triple H is still mostly in charge. Um, I think that'll help. Um, you won't probably won't see any direct references However, though, you'll see you'll see the subtle nods. Yeah. Um, with guys having like 
with bright with a more of a a one or two color wardrobe or stuff like that. I I just hope too, like you know, it's unfortunately passed away, but the Google numbers will probably be up through the roof, and hopefully, this new generation is going to see some of that old footage and be like, "Damn, this guy was awesome." Yeah, I I mean, I shared it on my personal Facebook page, the tribute video that the WWE did, the mm. like the three minute video, and it it says it a lot right right there in three minutes. Yeah. He's, he was the man, superstar Billy Graham. Yep. Uh, and Steve, thanks for jumping on this week, man. Thank you for filling in for Mike. Mike and I will be back next week. We are going to be joined by Pretty Ricky Wildley. I sat down with him at the last Barry Wrestling Show, had a great chat, all about Dropkick for Devin, which you can check out uh, at Brantford Wrestling. Uh, big show coming out there. Please support that if you can. Uh, Pretty Ricky, one of the nicest guys in all of the Ontario independent scene. We have a fun little chat next week. I can't wait for that. I will be counting down the top seven um, comedy wrestlers of all time in honor of Pretty Ricky because that guy is fucking hilarious. And if him you guys, and Puff. him and Puff are fantastic. And if you need any further proof of that, go to the Barry Wrestling YouTube page. Check out the Wild Rovers match. I don't know if you've seen that. I one was yet. there for that. You were there. That was the one that you went to. That's correct. Uh, yeah. No, my my wife and I actually came up from Stony Creek to Barry very to watch josh alexander and but got a hell of a treat they actually were within just a few feet of us that is that, one of my that favorite soccer style match was hilarious one of my favorite moments that i've been a part of for barry wrestling was that match for the, sure the VAR. oh yeah that was so fun we we had a great time with that match and always a great time at barry wrestling the last show was phenomenal uh if you guys don't have iwtv you need to subscribe just to see the hot stepper versus young jay lee which might be one of the greatest matches I've ever seen in Barry Wrestling history up until the main event of the Steel Cage match between Reverso and Gabriel Fuerza, which two match of the year candidates on one show. It was a great night at the uh, at the Barry Wrestling, as always. New world champion to be crowned next month, June 10th, the day after my birthday. So that is going to be a fun time. But I got the show for another day. Uh, this show is all about the honor and the memory of superstar Billy Graham. So RIP to the great superstar Billy Graham. I will I will raise my my glass to him that we can't see on screen. Cheers. And um uh, Steve, you want to be Mike today and you want to take us home? Sure. And until next week, you have been counted out. Ring the bell. Cheers. <laughs>